Canine Radio. I'm Greg Tawney. With me, Rich Hartman. Rich, what's going down? Hey, before we get started today, I want to talk about a couple of our sponsors, and I'm going to start with Anukshuk because lately, Anukshuk Marine has become not only our food of choice, but it's become our treat of choice. So we get a lot of dogs that come in from pet dog owners, and the list of um, accoutrements that they have with their pet dogs that they want us to feed their dogs. Hey, Sparky eats uh, bacon in the morning and likes to have some gravy and a little bit of cottage cheese in the afternoon. And then they wonder why we can't hand hand feed their dog uh, any kind of treats because I'm not reaching my hand into my pouch and grabbing them, you know, a cup full of cottage cheese and trying to lure Sparky into a sit. So, the thing that's been helping this is almost every dog that has a picky diet has been taking Marine as a treat. And for us, we use kibble uh, almost probably 100% of the time as a treat for a dog because if we can get a dog to work for its kibble rather than some high-value treat, then the dog is able to maintain good gut balance. Uh, we don't have a dog that has a bunch of diarrhea because it's eating treats all day long. Um, keeps them healthier. So... The solution for our training lately has been Anukshuk Marine. Obviously, we use all the formulas to feed dogs, 2616 for young dogs, 3025 for adult dogs. But the Anukshuk Marine has been, definitely been the answer for dogs that are picky, dogs that have some allergies, and definitely dogs that uh, aren't wanting to hand feed uh, and take you know take food from our hand for treats. So yeah, shout most out of to our police. Anukshuk. 100%. And most of our police dogs are uh, feeding it. It's a high-performance dog food. Uh, we were just talking with our guests that we're going to introduce here in a minute about the importance of putting good stuff in your body. It's no different for our dogs. High-performance food, it's basically for athletes. Um, and if you have a police dog, you have an athlete. Hey, uh, a couple other sponsors we have out there, Ray Allen Manufacturing. Uh, good people. If you're looking for good people, uh, to do business with, and then you want good equipment, uh, go to Ray Allen manufacturing, rayallen.com. You can get everything from leashes to bowls, all the way up to heat alarms, to, to bite equipment, to anything you need canine related one stop shop, which I know Sergeant usually likes, right? Because, uh, they can just go one place and write one PO order, do one order. Uh, it's what we're recommending all of our basic handler people uh, to do. Uh, one of the best harnesses in the industry. And speaking of harnesses, Modern Icon uh, also has one of the best harnesses in the industry. You can't go wrong with either one. Um, you can find them at moderneicon.us. And if you use the keyword radio, you will get an additional discount. Um, all of our dogs that are coming into the basic handler class, that's what we're recommending. They're both excellent harnesses. Can't say enough good things about them. Absolutely. I actually have six uh, modern icon harnesses hanging up in the van right now. They've been uh, a really good harness and applicable to all sizes of dogs. We're using them on the detection dogs and the bite dogs. So good stuff. I really like the modern icon harness. Awesome. You ready to jump into it? Hey, and before we do, um, this is one of those topics where when I first heard it, I had that visceral reaction. I, and we talked about this with like with the breaker bar and so many other things that we wind up embracing. Um, but you hear you're like, what am I, dogs on a hostage rescue? Like, what are we doing here? Like your initial reaction is like, this is this is dumb. Like what 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 how could this work out? And then once you get past your initial reaction, I think it's a human reaction with a lot of new things, and you actually listen to it, you're like Okay, this makes a whole lot of sense, and how are we, how are we applying it, how are we training it, and uh, this is why we have our guest on today. Awesome. You want to uh, do the introduction, Greg, and uh, let, the know, let the world know who we're talking to? Absolutely. We're talking about Jason Statham, uh, <laughs> our guest. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, he may look like a, a Jason Statham figure. Uh, obviously, he's uh, Lieutenant Mike Walsh with Riverside Sheriff's Department. And, and, and here's the thing. Um, you know, talking with uh, the guys that work with with Mike, he is kind of the Jason Statham of the of the agency. He's one of those guys that's like he's a lieutenant, but he's putting the young guys to shame out there on the physical fitness field. And if you look at him, he's got like eight percent body fat, and uh, he means business. So um, he walks the talk, right? So um, anyway, with us, Lieutenant Mike Walsh, Riverside County Sheriff's Department. Mike, thanks for coming aboard. Good morning, fellas. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. 
Absolutely. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, some of your background, and uh, what you're doing now? Uh, sure. You know, I grew up on the East Coast. Now I live here in sunny California. Uh, the weather's a bit nicer, but uh, I enlisted in the Marine Corps, and I went from New York all the way to California where the weather was, again, nicer. No snow, unless you wanted to go to it. I don't miss the snow, to be honest with you, but uh, after getting out of the Marine Corps, I knew I wanted to get into law enforcement, and uh, I got hired by the Sh Riverside County Sheriff's Office, and uh, fast forward 28 and a half years, give or take, and here we are. It's been a fantastic career, and I've been fortunate enough to, as a big agency as we are, I've been fortunate I, to join our SWAT team, and I've been on the SWAT team for roughly out of 28 and a half, I've been there for 24, almost 25 years on the team wow. at the various ranks. I was a sergeant. For, I was a team leader for about 16 years of it. Uh, I was a deputy sheriff on the team for a while. And then we were a part-time team when I first tried out. There was, uh, because the county is so large and it's really spread from east and west, we had an east and a west team. And I was part of the west team, which consisted of about 16. The east team consisted of about 16. Uh the mission profile was almost the same, but uh, far now in 2024, we have more responsibilities. But uh, long and short of it is about 2004, we formed a full-time team at that point. So we took the 16 and 16 and joined forces. And uh, of course, we had to trim some of the fat a little bit, get rid of some people because uh, the numbers just didn't bear out. So the team was a bit smaller. But again, the same profile, and uh, the mission was defined at the time, but as you know, with anything brand new, uh, there's growing pains, and there were. Uh, I tested for sergeant shortly thereafter, and I uh, was promoted, went to a patrol station as a patrol sergeant, and then the team grew incrementally by another squad, squad consisting of about a sergeant, corporal, six deputies, and I was asked to come back, and I did, and, and that's all she wrote for the next 16 years as a sergeant on that team. So that was, uh, on with our team. It's fa it's been a fantastic run. And in around 2019, uh, we, our canine team, which was canines were more or less assigned to every station, but, uh, then they were centralized under our bureau and under our command. And, uh, we had been using dogs integrated with our team for quite some time prior to that. Uh, it just made it a little clunky because they weren't centralized under our command. So you had to deal with other command. Uh, they had other responsibilities, other commands, other stations. And so they didn't belong to us. So uh, you only you could limit. We were limited on what we could do and how far we could integrate. But uh, once we uh, kind of got through that, we were able to navigate our way through that. We used uh, some of our handlers that are now sergeants today. Um, and we've been we really don't go home. We don't leave home without the dogs. Wherever we go and the SWAT team is deployed, the dogs go with us nice. in some capacity. And in around 2013, we got a debrief from the FBI. They had a, an incident that occurred in Alabama where a suspect had grabbed a, uh, a young autistic child and took him into a bunker. And it went on for three or four days before they actually had to do a tactical intervention. And it was a unique, very unique circumstance because of the, the, the bunker itself, the design of it, how it was built into the ground, how there was a stairway leading into the bunker. It, by no means is it your typical residential home, not even close. So, and, and he sustained life in there for several days on end. And uh, when they actually did go to a tactical intervention, part of their intervention plan was using a canine. And uh, at first glance, you're like, how would the dog fit into this? How does the dog fit into this rescue piece? And uh, they, as they described, they go, hey, we put a muzzle on the dog so he could muzzle strike or separate people or distract or all the above. And again, at first glance, like you had mentioned, Greg, about something, something new where you're like, mm, you know, I, I just can't. I'm not tasting it yet. So. As we watched the video, the dog was part of the rescue plan, but the, the dog would, didn't work for him. Uh, it never went into the bunker. It, uh, it was almost, a, it, it almost gives the appearance. It was like a cat, putting a cat in the toilet. His feet were out. He's like, man, I'm not having it. And uh, anyway, they do the intervention. Not that you've rescue. done that. Not yeah, that you, no. let's, let's clarify. <laughs> nor do we, nor do we promote that. 
right? <laughs> We're not putting cats in toilets. No. Okay, good. No, no. Especially with the seat down. Especially with the seat down. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, the dog didn't work as designed, but I saw, we saw the wisdom in what they were trying to achieve. They rescued a child, and uh, that incident concludes. Still one of the probably a premier team conducting this rescue with all the challenges associated with it is one of the most difficult rescues that have ever mm. occurred domestically here in the United States. I give Mike, those guys were, a lot of credit. Mike, you were I'm saying sorry. that the, uh, that it was, uh, the whole cat in the toilet thing. Does that mean that the entry into that bunker was essentially would have been like a, from a square at the top of the bunker? Like, was yes. It, like almost like ground level. So, uh, almost like mm. a manhole, but it was square. Okay. And so, you, you know, it was one way in, one way out. I mean, they explored a number of options, contingency, should they get a failed breach, because that's the only breach point. And there really wasn't a lot of options other than we have to go this way. And the objective of the dog was actually, you know, this descent is, it's got to be at least 12 feet down into this bunker. And you can call it a stairs, but it's more like a ladder that leads into the bunker at the at the base of it. And the idea was to put the dog down there, almost like grab him by his harness. He's got his muzzle on and just let him free fall to the bottom. He's likely potentially to get injured on the fall itself. And then who knows what occurs when he's actually down there. Now, the muzzle was obviously on the dog. So if he does see the child and impact the child, he doesn't bite the child under most circumstances. He just can impact the child. But the suspect, who would probably have an aha moment if he saw that and be like, how did that thing get down here? And it might, if, and at the same, at the end of the day, it doesn't sound sexy, but if he's shooting the dog, he, he's not shooting the child, and he's not shooting law enforcement. And that was the idea of the rescue concept. And um, again, it didn't work for him, but we saw the wisdom in it. So we came back to our shop, and then I remember one day doing instrument entry training in an old building before it was demolished. <clears throat> like, hey, let's try this. And of course, you know, you're surrounded by. 30, 32 other guys, a few handlers, probably four or five of them that are present with us. And uh, they're like, this is ludicrous. What are we doing? I go, hey, just entertain. let's just entertain it. Just entertain it. Again, it's not palatable at first. At first glance, you're like, this is just dumb. That's what people are under depression. This doesn't work. There's a bunch of ideas of why it's not going to work when we really don't, we haven't even tried it. So we explored it. We started with just, here's a room. It's probably a 10 by 15 room. It's not large. We're going to put a role, two role players in there. Both of them are canine handlers, and they know how to agitate as well. And so we gave one a simunition gun, an unloaded simunition gun. We said, hey, you're going to grab the, the other guys, the hostage. You're the suspect. You're going to give him the old classic overlay. You're going to grab one arm around his neck. You're going to screw the gun to the side of his head, and I want you to stand over here. And I'm not going to tell you what we're going to do. So then we had the entry team outside the room. And it was a matter of, hey, we got enough people. We, we're going to simulate some distractions, additional distractions like flashbangs, et cetera, uh, maybe even a window port. But then we're going we're gonna to breach the door. We're going to send the dog in. And uh, we, we did this first rep, and that's where everybody was like, I want to see. I want to see. And they just kind of watched it. And there wasn't a lot of debris or furniture in there, so it was a fairly simplistic scenario. We pushed them into the corner more or less opposite of the entry port of the room. We sent the dog. The dog went in there. He identified obviously two people. They were both of them were somewhat animated in the in their actions in the scenario. And the dog drives his nose, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, more or less between the two of them, and it separates them, almost like a bowling ball hitting bowling pins. It starts to push him left and right into the gutter, into the reset device, and whatnot. It separates them. Now the entry team's on the heels of the entry with the dog. And now the shot, the overlay picture I described earlier on, is is different. In fact, the shot is just got a, far less complex than it was previously had the dog not been introduced into that. And then during the debrief, mind you, this is the first run. I mean, this is this is the maiden voyage of this idea. And during and the debrief, what what year was this, Mike? This is about 2014, 2013 ish. Okay. After okay. we had seen this thing, and so we. After we run that uh, scenario, we debrief it, and I asked the decoys, the role players, the handlers, and uh, the one who was acting as the suspect, I go, hey, you know what, you, you've muzzle fought a dog more than once in your career, you're good at it. 
what'd you think when the dog came in there? He goes, uh, the dog was able to accelerate within a, in a small amount, 15 feet to his maximum speed. And he goes, you can't take your eye off it. He goes, I'm looking at it going, man, that thing's coming right at me. And your first instinct is to defend yourself. That's your first instinct. So it, I didn't know what to do other than orient my unloaded simunition gun towards a dog and, and try to pull the trigger would be my first instinct. And when the dog hit me, it happened to strike. The majority of his muzzle strike was on our suspect. And when he separated from the hostage, he goes, because I was still upright and the dog was striking me more or less in the abdomen and the rib cage, trying to get higher, the, the deputies that came in for the rescue to complete the rescue, their shots were easy. They were 15 feet from the suspect. There was no overlay, no complexity in the shot. The dog wasn't even obstructing their shot for this particular scenario. So it was like all stars had aligned for this first maiden voyage. And uh, from that point forward, we started to realize its success. And then it kind of just grew from there. We were like, okay, maybe there's value in this is just one room that we're rescuing one hostage and one suspect. Let's take our one hostage hey Mike, and before, one suspect. Mike, before you go f any further, at this point, you're the SWAT guy. You have worked with the dogs, but you're not a dog guy, right? Like you're, you haven't trained dogs. You haven't really been a, I mean, I'm sure you've decoyed inadvertently at some point, but you're not a, you're not a decoy. <laughs> you're not a, you're not a, uh, you're not a handler and you're not a trainer. Absolutely right. I'm not a handler, never was a trainer, never ran a dog. I was just this, I was a senior team leader on our team at the time, and uh, I, got, I was fortunate enough to stay another ten or twelve years beyond that as the team leader. But that was the maiden voyage, and I was like, I just saw the wisdom in what the FBI was trying to accomplish, and uh, I'm like, man, that it, I tell you what, there is enormous value in that. I, I I was able to watch when they did the debrief for us. We watched the video; they had the actual video from an aircraft, so you got to watch the dog. It's mannerisms, it's behavior, the, the, the attempted insert into the bunker, the kind of failed insert into the bunker. And then you watch their agents can complete the rescue. And you, I'm still kind of just, I'm, there's two things that I'm tracking in that, in that debrief. One being, hey, that's one of the most complex rescues you'll ever be involved in. And two, the introduction of that dog or the attempted introduction, I'm like, man, there is just enormous value in that. That could s literally save people. And it's not an absolute tool by any means. It's just one more tool. The nice part is it's a tool that has its own mind and can think on its own, and it's mobile. And I go back to the days where you guys have probably worked special enforcement or you're dealing with dogs on a search warrant service. You know, the, the aggressive dogs towards the entry team and the cops that are trying to collect evidence, uh, render the house safe. And you've been in a round of those incidents where there's a dog shooting by law enforcement. Law enforcement has to shoot the dog because the dog was getting aggressive. And then you look at, just look at hit percentages sometimes on law enforcement shooting dogs. And you're like, dogs are small, they're fast, and they're hard to hit. So when I was, we were looking at some really unscientific data on dog shootings were like dogs are hard to hit and when they are hit uh they don't even realize they are hit in fact if you don't hit them in the sweet spot they don't even know they're hit at sometimes and that that, that level of aggression that level of, of aggressiveness is is ideal for the circumstances that we're discussing here that that is one robust distraction that could take a beating and so we started to, t we took that small idea, we took that 10 by 15 room and then we grew it. Hey, let's try it with two rooms. Let's see if the dog can identify where people are at. Let's try it with three rooms. Eventually it worked in, here's a 1500 square foot house. Here's a 2000 square foot house. Here's a wonky idea. Let's get two dogs and see if they can come to, they work together. They, and follow one another or work independently. Do we saturate the floor plan that much faster? And now we like to say the dog makes entry. The minute the dog walks through the door on, let's say, a 1,500, 2,000 square foot home, the dog hasn't provided any information at that point, which you really can turn into intelligence. We send the dog. Now, if the dog decides to run all the way down the hallway, take the first left he, or the, the last left he finds, he ends up in the kitchen, and then we get some contact, like some hooting and hollering, like a dog is hitting some human being. We just got information. 
and we turn it into intelligence by now, we know where people are, whether it's our good guy or our bad guy. We know where people are based on what the dog just did. And then we can send a formidable team down there to go solve that problem that much faster. That's intel. That's information we never had if we never deployed a dog. And that's the beauty of it. That's just one of the benefits of using that dog in addition to the distraction should you have your host again your hostage and your hostage taker in that same room where the dog went in because at these at 1500 square feet the dog just decided to just forget the first 1300 and decide to work the last 200 and because he decided to do that or he picked up human odor or there was some indicator for a dog to go down there where he's like hey i think they're over here he went down there and he found them and that is that again information we never had upon entry, and now we turn it into intelligence and we go after it. And we're like, man, real quick, Mike. Um, so, first off, listeners, uh, we're going to post some videos on YouTube. So if you're not watching this on YouTube, if you're just listening to this to the podcast, um, this is probably one you're going to want to watch so you can see the some of the videos that actually Mike provided. Um, and we might throw some training videos in there on the front end uh, for handlers because obviously, um, you know, you need dogs, specific dogs to do this task. You're going to need specific training. Uh, the dogs that they are using are very comfortable in the muzzle. They're very comfortable around the team. Um, I we like always we recommend don't ever deploy some in the, an environment that you haven't already trained with for your dogs. Uh, just so uh, our listeners are clear, Mike works for an agency. Is is Riverside the largest county in California? It's, uh, it's, San Bernardino it, County, I believe, is the San largest. Bernardino. We, are, we okay. are the largest as far as square miles. Our second okay. largest, I believe, as far as square miles. You guys are upwards to four or 5,000 sworn, correct? Somewhere uh, in that neighborhood? I don't think we're that high. I want to say it's closer to 2,000 or 2,500. There's like okay. 5,000 employees that we have a bunch of okay. classified and correctional personnel, et cetera. Okay. And that's, yeah, that's, so, uh, I mean, you, you, you work for a pretty busy agency. Um, you've, act, obviously you have a SWAT team that's full time and then you guys are, um, you guys are getting work. So, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about tactics or we're discussing methods of, of deployment, a lot of it's theoretical, right? We get a lot of guys and we got trainers out there that everything is theory. It has never been practiced. And um, just so our listeners know, this is something that you guys obviously have been doing for a while now. And um, Mike, how many times, uh, and, and the other thing I also want our listeners to know is, you know, if, if you're not in law enforcement, like by the time the team is at the point of entry, like everything has failed. Negotiations have failed. Um, there is a substantial risk to life. Uh, and typically if in a hostage situation, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's go time. We, we need to get that hostage safe. And this is going to be very dangerous, probably one of the most dangerous, uh, um, entries that any team is going to do. And so, um, we've kind of gotten to that point. So a lot of other things have been tried up to this point. So, um, Mike, how, how many times, uh, have you guys actually used this tactic on a deployment, uh, in the last number of years? So we've had, uh, we've probably used it anywhere from eight to 10 times on actual hostage rescues. And uh, has it been successful all eight to 10? I can't say that. Uh, has it been successful for the majority and the dog worked as designed? Yes, it has. Uh, we, and, and we, we, we seen, we deem success. Maybe people judge success in various ways, but we look at one of the ways of success is like, it made contact with the occupants of the home. It provided us the information. We turned intelligence. We made contact with those occupants. Did it result in, in an officer or a deputy involved shooting every time? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Sometimes the uh, we're dealing with an edge weapon. Sometimes we're dealing with suspects that are threatening to shoot a hostage with a firearm and a firearm they don't possess, or it's a replica firearm. So a lot of them don't end in necessarily a shooting, but some do. But the dog has been very, very effective under the majority of them. And, and we, before we deploy the dog or even integrate, and you hit it on the head, Greg, about roughly 85% of hostage rescues end in the surrender of the suspect. We trained for that 15% that required the tactical intervention. And part of the tactical intervention, there's a lot of moving parts, especially on a well-choreographed, deliberate entry. 
It could be multiple entry points. It can be window breaching, explosive breaching, a number of distractions, sniper initiated assaults, etc. Window porting. All these are viable options. We're including now into this entire more or less parade the dog. We've added the dog. And a lot of it's based on sometimes it's dog analysis. And you hit it on the head as well when you talked about we have we spent time training with the dogs. We spent a lot of time training. In fact, we have some dogs that aren't necessarily capable of doing this. And we have a smaller number in our fleet that are capable. And the, the, the demeanor of the animal is important. I mean, you can literally be one door away from the action. And if you have a dog in a muzzle and you're trying to be in a somewhat clandestine environment and the dog is squealing or it's, it's breathing hard, he can compromise your position. So again, you have to really know what dog you're taking into that environment and if they're capable of doing it. So we uh, we don't generally advocate going, hey, this dog's never done this before, but he does pretty good in other kinds of police work. So put a muzzle on him and let's go. And then you really know what you, that you don't know what you're going to get. So it's it, training is important. And then you take that, you're going to find that, hey, these dogs, the, a lot of our dogs are great for a lot of applications. And then you're going to find a smaller amount are good for this application. And then you find even a smaller amount that are great for this application. And those are the ones you use consistently over and over again. Unfortunately, I wish there was a way to speed up this. We find some of our best dogs for this purpose that are seven, eight years old. And it took them this long to get this good at it. And then you realize their service life sometimes is nine or 10 years. And you're like, man, we're only going to get another two, three, four years tops out of this dog. And it's and you're like, man, I just I'm gonna miss him when he's gone because he's absolutely perfect for this for this task. So I I would I would I would I cannot advocate strong enough for hey you train with it you find if you have 20 dogs in your fleet, don't anticipate having 20 dogs being capable of hostage rescue under most circumstances. You may end up with four or five, and those are the four or five you're gonna really lean on for that task. I think uh, I'm and and you may not. Well, you probably realize this now since you've been doing it since 2014, but is, is what you're seeing is a dog that has its eye on the prize and has clarity enough to know that when I'm doing this job, I'm always looking for the bad guy. I don't give a shit about the dog next to me because I'm looking for the bad guy. And we don't always find that in two-year-old dogs, right? The two-year-old dog is like, hey, what are you doing here? What's going on? Like, what's in my bubble? And they forget about the bad guy. And they might likely get into a fight in the first hallway, right? Because... Two two-year-old dogs, they go into a room to look for a bad guy, are more likely to get into a fight in room one than they are to ever even venture down the hall to look for a bad guy. But a five, six, seven-year-old dog that's had success searching and finding a suspect typically is no longer looking at other dogs as a problem. And we see a lot of those older dogs that will even walk pet dogs, walk pet, uh, cats, food, all those things because they know what their task is. And unfortunately, just like, you know, good cops, good operators, whatever it is. Sometimes it just takes time to mature and develop to the point where you can trust the dog to do those kind of things. I want to take a step back just because what you, the picture you painted of the dog that runs kind of down the end of the building, happens to find a guy in the kitchen, those kind of things. That's not your typical search pattern with a dog on a regular, let's go into a, uh, a, a building and search with a dog. Slow and deliberate. Doing slow, deliberate, limited penetration kind of stuff with the dog. You're not like, hey, dog, run 2,000 square feet away and, and let me know what you find? Or or do you typically search wide open with the dogs and let them find what they find and then call them back? So a lot of times in, it's – um, it, I'm sorry. In a non-hostage situation. Oh, in a non-hostage situation. Okay. Yeah, it's a completely different format. So you're doing things – the tactics are employed are different. Uh, you're, you're not looking at, hey, the dog's – we got to be diligent about how we use the dog under those circumstances to catch our bad guy. And, you know, we're trying to also minimize the dog, no doubt, minimizes risk to the deputies or the police officers. But, you know, in that deliberate search that you described, Rich, we're, we're also trying not to we're also trying to minimize some risk to the dog because we don't want you hey, send the dog down there. That guy's got a firearm. You're like, OK, he shot the dog. You're like, cool, man. Mission accomplished. Uh, not really. So there was a better way to go about that. But on a hostage rescue. You take the leash off, the muzzle's on the dog, and you say, hey, there's 2,000 square feet in front of you. You go wherever you'd like. 
In fact, all I want you to do is find humans wherever they may be. And at some point, when I talk about this is what you'll learn in training, it's not necessarily failures, but they're animals and we understand their limitations. We may send the dog into 2,000 square feet and the dog's still looking for the, they see the pack. So the, the dog that you mentioned, Rich, that's somewhat neutral to the cat food, the extra cat, the other dogs, the other odors in the house, even the deputies that are walking through the door. Sometimes even under those circumstances, they don't find the good guy or the bad guy before the cops do. And that's just real life because the dog turned left when everybody was to the right. But that's how things go in real life. But there's going to be more often than not that the dog will make contact or find a the or the occupants of this home before the cops do. And depending on the size of the floor plan. And we, we're not advocating either that, hey, if you're not comfortable letting your dog go for 2,000 square feet, maybe you're the, you're running a program where we all, if we got the guy isolated to one or two bedrooms, that's when we bring the dog into this equation. And that might be the circumstances for you as an agency to decide that don't, because we don't want the dog running necessarily loose or the dog's not as neutral as we want it to be to even police officers and deputy sheriffs. So what we want to do is like, hey, when we got them isolated in this room and maybe we do some, we like to call it real estate theft or isolation drill where you're kind of chewing up some real estate. You're turning 2,000 square feet into 200. We isolate the action into one bedroom. And then you're like, now we're going to introduce the dog should there be a tactical intervention at that point. But for us, we've learned that, hey, you can be successful in 200 square feet. You can also be successful in 2,000 square feet. I'll tell you what, it does pay some serious dividends when you're dealing with two-story homes. And when you think you're not sure if the action is upstairs or downstairs, but if the first thing that goes up the stairs is the dog and not a human, because that's a, generally an ambush point or a choke point for your entire team up the stairs, the best thing to do is send something up there first. So a lot of times we send flashbangs first. But a flashbang in conjunction with a dog might pay, even pay, it might pay bit dividends. And you're like, yeah, I got to send something up there first other than us. We're going to we're going up there. But can we just lead that entry upstairs with something else, such as a dog? And it- yeah. yeah. And, and Mike, just to, to touch upon that again for our listeners that newer to law enforcement or even that aren't in the law enforcement that are listening to this. You know, every person has to go through a, a, a process mentally when they're confronted with a situation. And we call it UDA. Um, and that's basically they observe what's going on, they orientate themselves, uh, they decide what they're going to do, and then they actually act. And so the addition of another element when a team is making entry, because the bottom line is if I hold up, if I get into my house and I'm waiting for somebody to come into that house, I have every tactical advantage that I am waiting for somebody to come through that threshold. And usually you're waiting for a human being, and I've already made up my mind what's going to go on. But by deploying these additional tactics, the person has to now, it interrupts their thought process, thus buying time for the operators that are actually behind the eight ball that have to make entry, right? Because again, lives are on the line, their lives as well. And they're putting their lives on the line so that others can live. I mean, it's it's a, a, a noble mission. Uh, and in order to do that, we're utilizing the dog to buy extra time so that the hostage goes home safe that the operators go home safe and it kind of takes that tactical advantage a little down a couple notches for the, for the suspect that's now waiting for the operators to come into the door. So by using these resources, I mean, you know, I I would say these dogs are saving lives during this mission potentially. I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, uh, when we do, when you run scenarios in training and you do the old, the lying wait scenario, the suspect has a firearm, it's a one bedroom. He's pointed his firearm towards the door. He has a hostage in there. And you're going to walk in and you're, you're trained to defeat the guy. You're, it's hard to defeat, especially some worthy adversary that has a firearm oriented towards the door. He knows what direction you're coming in. Let's just say there's no other doors or windows in that room. So there's only one way in, one way in, more or less. We can talk about ceilings and basements and whatnot. But for, for, for this discussion... That doorway is really the only one way in, one way out, and the suspect has a distinct advantage. There's no doubt. He has a distinct advantage, and he's expecting action at that door. When the deputies or the police officers walk through that door, they have to find their opponent. The suspect doesn't have to find their adversary, which is us. All he has to do is look at the door because they got to come through there. 
But if the first thing that goes through the door is a dog and a muzzle, maybe followed by a flashbang in addition to more additional distractions, but the dog through the, is the important part piece here, is the dog with a muzzle through that door? For a moment, the suspect, if you think about the OODA loop as you just described, Greg, the OODA loop almost like it takes a second because you got to observe that, and then you got to the observation phase and even the orient phase. You're observing it, and your brain isn't necessarily processing what's even occurring at that point. Going, what is that? Who invited that thing in here? <laughs> and it just takes that moment for those guys to go. That is that that bodes well for us. All that delay bodes well for us. And that dog, as you mentioned, Greg, does save lives. It saves lives. It saves lives, increases our safety, increases hostage safety, and saves lives. And it allows us for under those circumstances that where it's applicable, quicker intervention, when generally quicker intervention, decisive intervention, if it becomes necessary, is what saves lives. And this is just one more component to do just that. You know, at the beginning of this thing, when I was talking earlier on about the dogs, is when I said, was it, was it, not, it wasn't necessarily palatable, you know, some of the pushback was on the handler side. Hey, you're going to send my dog in there to get killed. And potentially you're like, yes, I'm telling you now, it is a potential that we could get your dog killed. There's no doubt about that. I wish there was a way to say it. I, there isn't, but the, the reality is that's possible. But I want you to, and I tried to convince them, I go, I want you to, I'm not telling you to do it because you're like, well, I'm the sergeant, you're the deputy, this is what you're going to do. I'm not telling you from that framework. I'm telling you from the position of, if I want you to think about what your dog is doing here. We're not necessarily trading the dog's life for a human life, but in some respect, we are. So I want you to think about when your dog goes in there, what's our number one objective in law enforcement under these circumstances in this hostage crisis? It's to save the hostage. Whether we're through negotiation or tactical intervention, our goal is to save the hostage. And if we have to do tactical intervention, when you use the dog in conjunction with, and it's one of the appropriate tools to use in this rescue, you will find that... Uh, a lot of your handlers that have a fond bond with their dogs, which is understandable because they live with them. They're part of their families. I get it. And you're like, I'm going to send my dog to go do what? And like, yeah, I get it. But I think when you sell it to them from that position, they're just like, I, I understand. Now I understand the mission. Well, I, I think also it's probably the safest way to implement the dog into this situation because in this situation where you have a hostage taker, if we go slow and deliberate with somebody who's clearly down there, in there, whatever it is, waiting for us, and it's been, you know, a uh, drawn out amount of time, which it likely is by the time this whole scenario takes place, they know when we're coming, they know when the doors are being breached, they know... Man, when you have two dogs muzzled coming at you, and I think it's easy for us, Greg and I have been doing dogs for 30 years, and whenever we're out on the training field and something fucks up and you hear loose dog, our OODA loop's fucked up, and we've been doing it for a long time. We're like, hey, <laughs> loose dog where? You know, like we, heads on a swivel, <laughs> takes us out of our game a little bit. Like I'm, we're immediately in that mode, and I'm, you know, and we know what to do. We know what the response is. We both have tugs in our pocket. You know, like we know – but my mind is immediately taken off the task at hand and I have to stop. And now I'm like, and then God forbid you see the dog inbound towards us in a loose dog situation or a dog pops out a back door of a building or something like that. Um, you, you have to start thinking pretty quickly and all of your focus is on the dog and how to mitigate damage at that point. And I think, you know, I can't imagine that a suspect who's, not high out of their mind isn't going to have the same you know response to that and two of them coming in it, it reminds me um i'm trying to think of an analogy but it feels like a flashbang with legs that is pursuing the suspect that's a lot of and, that's a lot to deal with and that distraction you mentioned you know you have flashbangs there's multi-bangs they now to increase you know so the distractions go longer they provide more distraction over a longer period of time the dog is is nice because it is a distraction device, but it keeps on distracting. It just keeps on yeah. distracting. And when you send two, and th this has to be worked out in training, because you'll find that dogs are, some dogs are just not dog friendly. So you're like, instead of doing their job, they end up fighting with one another, even though if they have muzzles on. <clears throat> but I will say, 
if you find two that are fairly neutral to one another, we've had good success where we've seen them, they pack up and they follow one another. Good, good, but not necessarily ideal under some circumstances. Sometimes you want them to separate and search independent because if they search independent, they crush more floor plan faster. And the faster they crush floor plan, the better. And there's going to be times when you train with your team, like I got two dogs going in on this entry. I'm sending one downstairs and one, the handler has control of his dog till we get to the base of the stairwell. And that one's being deliberately sent upstairs. So you get and crush both 2,000 square feet, 1,000 on the bottom, 1,000 on the top with two dogs, and you're deliberately inserting one upstairs and deliberately inserting one downstairs. So there could be those circumstances. Mike, from watching the video, can you address um, the fact that inevitably in these situations, a it's likely that the the victim, the hostage, is going to be struck by the dog and – do we care? And if they don't get struck by the dog and you don't implement the dog in this situation, um, you know, what's the likeliness that other bad things are going to ha happen to that hostage? So I guess really, if you fast forward to the conclusion of some hostage rescues, the bad thing is the, the hostage is killed by the hostage taker. So we put the muzzle on a dog. So obviously the, the person's less likely to get bit. It, nothing guarantees anything such as if the muzzle falled off, the muzzle malfunctioned or he, you have the muzzle where it's kind of like a cage and people can stick their fingers in the cage and get bit. Those are all potentials, potential circumstances. However, when it comes to the actual dog, the risk of the dog muzzle striking, that is a real possibility. But we triage our victims. This is all part of the, uh, the product here is we triage our victims. Now, if we're rescuing a six-month-old baby and the suspect is the child's father, we know a 60, 70 pound dog with a muzzle on could maybe even hurt or kill a child. So it might not be the appropriate tool. We also know if we have an elderly person, 90 years old, very frail, and they're the, they're the hostage and we're attempting to rescue them, they may not be able to absorb a muzzle strike either. It, it could kill them or seriously injure them. So it may not be the appropriate tool there. But when you start dealing with like-sized adults or Kids that are no longer small kids, we're talking about 10, 11, 12, some teenagers or other adults that are in 20s and 30s within re reasonably healthy, they can take a muzzle strike if, if it's – because the dog can't necessarily discern going, hey, that's the good guy, that's the bad guy. A lot of times when they find two occupants or they find their first occupant, they're going to engage. There's going to be times when the dog's going to find your hostage before it ever finds your hostage taker and begins to muzzle strike your hostage taker. I'll give you a corny example. You have a male and female hostage taker and a hostage. Your hostage is the female. The hostage taker is the male. That You send a dog into 2,000 square feet. He finds the room where the female is at, starts muzzle striking her, and you hear distinctly a female voice. So you know your hostage is the dog's making contact with your hostage. So you're going to send the appropriate resources to that room. And you may make entry into that room and find only she is present. And you're like, okay, she took a couple of blows from the dog, no doubt. But we got here faster and got to protect her sooner because the intel the dog provided. The information it provided, which we turned into intelligence, sent a contact team down there. Con and for conceptually, we've rescued her. However, the rescue is not complete because it may involve an extraction. And there's going to be times, and this is a little further in depth in the conversation, there's going to be times when we've rescued our hostage or we've sheltered them in place, and now we need to repurpose the dog for our extract. And the repurposing is, I'll give you a, a simplistic example. We found our female hostage 700 square feet into our 1,500 square foot house. But we have to go, the route we have to exit with her in pocket is the same way. But it is, it's laden with numerous danger, danger areas because – uh, uh, the other 800 square feet and maybe in parts of the 700 are not rendered safe. We have her. Now it's time to extract. There's going to be times we repurpose the dog. We're like, hey, we're going to take the muzzle off and we're going to send the dog into the other 800 square feet. And he may go on a bite. He could defend himself. But it's designed as we're going to throw flashbangs into that 800 square feet. We're going to send the unmuzzled dog into that 800 square feet. And we're going to get out of this house in the 700 square feet we already entered or 
partially cleared. So it could be repurposed under those circumstances. And ideally, if we do get the hostage and they're into a, a safe place, we will attempt to recall the dog. We want to recall the dog and bring the dog. And if the dog comes back injured or uninjured, regardless, the dog never wanted a bite, but we rendered, we we're, we moved to a position of safety. We're going to try to get the dog back out there because we're not just leaving the dog in there to fend for mm-hmm. himself. But there could be times that we repurpose the dog to facilitate the extract, if that makes sense. Mike, have you introduced this to other uh, agencies that are near you or other agencies that have shown interest in this? We have. And uh, a lot of a lot of the agencies that work around us, they're smaller agencies, so their dog fleet's a bit smaller. So they may have a dog fleet of, let's just say, five. And they realize, hey, their dogs under these some general rules that, or concepts that we're discussing here, the dog isn't necessarily, of those five, they don't have the perfect one. We have the luxury of having 20 and then picking three or four out of that one. They only have five, and maybe they get one, maybe they get none, and they're like, hey, just these dogs don't have the demeanor to do this. Or their purpose is limited under these circumstances, such as, hey, they'll be great to throw into a 10 by 15 room, but they're not going to be so good to be thrown into a 2,000, 3,000 square foot home. Hey, Mike, the dogs that you're using, are they assigned to your team or are these dogs that have uh, ancillary duties in patrol and they also work with the team? So our dogs that uh, the short answer is they have ancillary duties. They they still go to patrol calls. They handle uh, support patrol and, and dog and provide dog service. And a lot of times the working dog is the best dog. And uh, so that that business out there that they're doing on the daily, whether it's a, a a, a guy who stole a car and now he's hopping fences and we got to do a canine search for him. They're all involved in that. And uh, so those dogs kind of keeps their edge sharp. It's like, hey, we do this and you still do this and being capable of doing both. But uh, again, it's unfortunate. It's fortunate, but unfortunate. Unfortunate because we don't discover these dogs really don't reach their peak performance till they're like seven, eight years old. And you're like, man, this is the perfect dog. And he's like, cool, man, he retires in two years. And you're like, well, enjoy it yeah. while it lasts. Yeah, well, I and mean, we like to compare it, right, to the, the average deputy that comes in, right? You got to get in there. You got to get experience. You got to figure out what you're doing. Um, and then down the line, you will make it to a tactical team. I mean, we tell our handlers the same way. Our dogs are the same way. Like, we want to see several street engagements before they're going to be working at a high level with a team like yours. And, man, you are looking for that special dog, right? You're looking for a dog that's very neutral to other, uh, other operators. Dogs are neutral to other dogs. Dogs that hunt well. Dogs that are, and not every dog even does muzzle very well, right? So you got to have that dog that's real combative in the muzzle. Uh, one that's quiet. Um, you know, it's it's uh, definitely a special animal that's going to excel um, in this type of mission. So, um, and then my other question is, how often are you guys training with with these dogs? Uh, at least several times. As a, we have a whole team training weekly, um, that occurs. I integrate once a month or so and then but at squad level the individual squads within the team they're integrating sometimes even several times a week there's a lot of that basic integration that we go over um it never gets old and you got to be really good at it and we try to change the training environment too for the dog so the dog doesn't um and it, the dog doesn't see the same floor plan over and over again the dog it's, it's new to the deputies it's new to the dog and, uh, you know, one of the little things we use in training that um, we were fortunate enough to train another agency uh, out on uh, going east. And we did this little trick with them. I go, hey, you guys ever heard about this dog integration for hostage rescue? And they're like, no. He goes, uh, we'd love to try it. So we gave them, again, it was your atypical 2,000 square feet. It was a business. It was a hallway with rooms left and right, as you can envision. And so nothing fancy, nothing sexy. Sent the put the role players, the, the hostage and the hostage taker, put them on, you know, all the way down the hallway, last room on the left. Sent the dog in there with the muzzle, followed by the entry team. The dog worked his way through one or two rooms that were close to the entry, the entry of the breach point. And then the dog took off all the way down the hallway and it ca- encountered your hostage and your hostage taker. And they had contact. They sent a team down there and they like, oh, this works pretty good. We debriefed it. No problem. We reset the scenario same dog 
And what I did was I took the hostage and the hostage taker and removed them from that room and stuck them in another room. But that dog had seen that floor plan. And this is where training comes in. We sent the dog in. The dog hits the breach point. He's like, the last place I got a reward was that last room on the left. And where did he go? All the way to the last room on the left, and nobody was home. So they saw the dog run. Last room on the left, they sent a contact team on there. I go, let me ask you guys this. I go, was the dog providing you any kind of information? And they're like, no. And I go, nope. You didn't hear people screaming. You didn't hear a muzzle fight occurring in that room. You didn't hear any gunfire associated with it. I go, you heard nothing. And then that dog came out of that room as you guys were making entry in that room by the time you caught up to it. And you realize well, there's nobody in here. I go, so the dog, you have to wait. And this is where patience and training comes in. You have to be patient and go, the dog is, especially if you use them in a large floor plan, is the dog providing me information or is the dog just running around this, the floor plan here and entering rooms and exiting rooms and entering rooms and exiting? I go, wait till he gives you something tangible. And honestly, there, you, everything has a fail point. So a dog could have a fail point. Mike, have you guys uh, integrated cameras into this situation yet, or are you going to? Is it? Uh, is uh, we've experimented we've, well, on the dog attack. Yeah. There is, so to answer your question, Rich, we have, uh, we just have, I guess we have yet to find the ideal camera under some circumstance. We've, we've experimented with some other cameras. We're testing a couple now. But we've expressed, we've tested some in the, in the in the past where we're cautious about what we're putting on the dog because, as you guys all know, as dog trainers, it gets stuck or gets trapped or it, it, it immobilizes the animal because he's stuck on it. We're even like, hey, do we want to put a vest on this dog? Because anytime you put something like that with handles on it, it allows a suspect to grab the handle too. But as a general rule, we're also running that vest to like with those two luggage handles on his back. So if we make entry in the room and the handler's not there and the dog's muzzle striking the, the victim or the suspect or both, and we're trying to apprehend the suspect, maybe it's not a shooting scenario, any deputy can grab the dog by his handles and pull him off the muzzle fight. So it gives him a handle to do so. So we find it, under most circumstances, it's advantageous that he wears that to have a handle on him. But to answer your question, Rich, about cameras, we're testing a few more. Um, we haven't had an enormous amount of success with it, but... Uh, we're all ears if you guys like, hey, try this camera. I'm like, hey, we'll give it a shot. I think just listening to what you're saying, and uh, we work with Elk Grove, Greg's alma mater, and Elk Grove runs with a lot of drones a lot of the time. Drones and dogs, drones and dogs, small drones, bigger drones, and getting the dogs neutral to the drones and having a drone that's about the size of a softball seems like it would be ideal for this situation, but... You also have to have a pretty good drone pilot that's following a dog that doesn't necessarily have a pattern. Right. At that point. And, uh, and, we, so. and we do, Rich, we do use a lot of drones. And we have the, the now the technology, some of these DJI ones, they're small. And you wear the VR goggles, and they're yep. fast. So, but it does take someone with some skills and somewhat <laughs> to fly that drone and more or less kind of hover over the dog and wherever the dog goes to provide the intel so, uh, and, and yep. not crash. And uh, it's almost like this drone race. And the dog takes some turns where you're like, oh, man, he took a turn that I missed my left. The drone pilot missed his left. The dog didn't miss the left, but the drone pilot missed the left. Yeah. So it's a challenge. No, it's all it's it's all good. I mean, who knew that you were going to be at this point, you know, 10 years ago, right? So whatever the future is, uh, I'm sure it'll be exciting to watch. I think this is really good stuff, and I think we're not – naive to think that this is something that's going to apply to every agency. I worked in a four dog agency when I was there, um, you know, just trying to, and, and I'm really big. We raised a lot of dogs for police work still, and I'm really big on getting our young dogs to work together. Um, I'll put two soccer balls out on the field and like, Hey, that's your ball. That's your ball specifically for this kind of stuff. And there's just some dogs that don't have the mentality for it. You know, there could be 10 soccer balls out on the field and they're going to fight over one. And then some dogs are very clear that, like, hey, I'm going to play over here, you play over there. It's a, it's, it's a hard situation to find two perfect dogs and a four-dog unit that's going to make this work. But I think if you have a bigger unit or you have two unicorns in your unit, this is something that, um, you know, could at least be worth training. Uh, keep in mind, not everybody's going to also work in an agency where you get 10 hostages held in, you know, the last decade. So I think that's uh, – Yeah. You guys yeah. have a few unique situations going on in your, in your area. And and Rich again, and this is, 
a lot of handlers already picked this up, but I just want to throw it out there. You should never be deploying generally as a general rule, right? Um, you should never be deploying into a situation that you haven't already trained with. So if your dog has not already been incorporated in the SWAT team um, or a tactical team and, and isn't already seen, a, you know, a number of pictures for us, uh, the, the SWAT threshold, if you're going to deploy with a SWAT team, you've already had a number of street apprehensions. You've seen a bunch of different pictures. Obviously, a passive is, is at the top of the list. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, it's not something that you're like, Hey, I'm going to put this in, in, in the back of my head. And, you know, if we ever have a hostage situation, we're going to, I'm going to grab my dog. Like you would have had to have, you know, tested your dog. You would have already trained this dog. You've already been working with your team and hopefully you have been, I'm going to post our videos. Uh, now at the end of this, the first few is just going to be some of the things we do for, um, muzzle neutrality. It's something we do with, and the dogs you see in there are actually just our patrol dogs. Um, I feel like a, every dog should be muzzle neutral and should be able to work around a tactical team. I don't care if you're on SWAT or not. Um, and then, um, I'm going to then post the, the videos that, that Mike sent, um, that's actually going to show you the dogs working with the teams and training and kind of how, uh, it, it'll kind of maybe you know, put some pictures with words for you um, if you've been listening to this podcast. Hey, Mike, last question for you. Uh, were you able to make this go full circle? Were you able to take what you guys took from the original debrief from FBI and be like, hey, this is what we've done with it and reintroduce it to that team so they can see um, a direction that they could they could go with that original idea? And we speak to them often. Uh, we have a SWAT commanders in our Southern California region, SWAT commanders monthly meeting multiple agencies include the FBI and uh, I can't thank them enough for like hey even the idea that didn't work and I'm like the idea that didn't work is now it's become part of our mainstay in what we do at Riverside Sheriff's Office because we see the enormous value in it again no tool is perfect in every circumstance but this dog has can change the game for you especially when you're up against a worthy adversary especially when you're like, I'm limited on my flashbangs. This requires a tactical intervention. I'm limited on personnel. I'm limited on trained personnel. But the, sometimes the force multiplier is the canine handler just showed up and go, hey, put a muzzle on him. Let's do this. And that changes the game. And, uh, again, it's not it's not an always and never, but there's going to be some circumstances where, like, this, this is going to provide enormous value. You know, there's challenges with no doubt when you have one suspect in – he, or you get your typical foiled Starbucks robbery, he goes in there, sticks a gun in the barista's face and says, hey, man, give me the money. And the cops show up. He's like, oh, man, I'm trapped inside the business. I'm going to hold all these people hostage. And now I got, let's say, 15, 20 patrons inside a store. That might not be the circumstances for the dog because now there's too much. Where the dog goes in there, he sees a, a likely a hostage based on numbers and just muzzle strikes the first person he sees and doesn't provide necessarily a distract. I get, again, it's not an always and never, but that might be the circumstance to go, hey, I'm not going to use the dog because it's not appropriate of this. But as negotiations with the suspect, he releases 19 of the 20 people, and the only person left is someone, the barista. And you're like, okay, we've, we've, just, we've distilled it down to two people involved in this. We have our hostage taker and a hostage. I go, maybe it's a reintroduction of the dog at that point. Mike, you're um... – You've been doing this a long time. You got a lot of experience. I know we talked before we started the podcast. Um, you might have some greener pastures coming um, in the future as far as moving on. Um, are you planning to um, do SWAT instruction and do any type of instruction when it comes to tactical teams uh, in your retirement? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I also know that hey, when when you do retire, and I haven't picked, I haven't decided to retire or anything like that so sure. uh, uh so no, my no. guys are listening to this they're, they're, my guys on my team are listening to this they're like he's not leaving i thought he was leaving but anyway <laughs> well you, you you you're able to right you're you're in the golden years as rich and i you, you hit 50 you, you've got your time in um but you're obviously uh very capable but you're such a resource because we get so many guys and even in the dog world that They've got all the philosophies down, but they've never had any practical application. You know, you've got such a tremendous amount of practical application. Like, what's the future hold for you at this point? Uh, I, I'll continue to what I'm doing now because I absolutely love what I do. I mean, and just the just the thought of not doing it anymore is kind of like, I don't even want to think about that. 
But I will say that uh, it does, but to be able to pass what we've learned, and I'll be honest with you, you, both Rich and Greg, you guys both know this, you learn more from failure than success. And what we, we have failed a lot of things in our careers, and whether it was in experimenting, which is the ideal place in some controlled environment, or you failed in real life, and but the opponent or your opposition was just kind of a pinhead, so we got away with one. And you're mm-hmm. like, okay, uh, let's make sure we don't do that again. So it not has not been perfect, but it's been awesome. It's really been awesome. And I've been lucky enough to be able to be affiliated with our team for over 20 years. And my the Swedish years, you say the golden years, Greg, I'm going to go, hey, the Swedish years is when I spent as a team leader. I, and that was, I'll tell you what. It's nothing more honorable than leading guys in the battle as needed. It's it's just it's awesome. It's awesome. But as we get to the age where we're like, hey, we may not we may not be zigging and zagging as often as the guys that are younger than us now, but we're going to try to pass on or knowledge dump everything we have onto them, so they're better than us when they hit our age. If if that's what we want you to be, we want you to be, be just like your kids. You're like, I want you to have a better life than I had. Here's what I'm going to do for you. And that's the idea here. And to take this concept and, you know, for some agencies that we have trained with this idea, um, the there's some agencies that are like, hey, it's just not for us. And we're like, Roger that. We copy. And, and for some agencies, it's not. And for some agencies that have no dogs, when they land on scene and they need dogs for like, let's say, a, a, a car thief that's jumping fences, they might dial up some dogs from another agency. But if they got to deal with some rescue, they're not necessarily apt to throw in another agency's dog into this. And nor is that other agency going, I'm just going to give you my muzzle dog. No, it's not going to work like that. So there's going to be there's a lot of agencies that are not interested or they just don't have the capability, the staffing, et cetera. And we're like, we totally get it. Or just like, hey, man, at first glance. And I, you said it early on, Greg, you're like, first glance, you're like, yeah, that that just sounds terrible. <laughs> And then you watch the videos and you start to do it in real life. And you're like, that's actually a pretty good idea. And then you watch the video from the FBI. And the only thing that's just so glaring in that thing is like, man, that's like, those guys are geniuses. They're absolutely geniuses. <laughs> and, uh, and they're like, but it didn't work. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. They're geniuses. I, you see the wisdom is it. And then even for our team internally, we're like, hey, we're going to try this. I mean, our command staff at the time, when we first tried it back in like 2014, they're like, you're going to do what? You saw some video when it didn't work, and then you're going to try something that didn't work? And I'm like, you're missing the point. <laughs> I go, if, but to kind of explain it to them and yeah. sell it to them. But there are agencies that just it's just not going to fit their program. And we're like, we get it. We're not here to sell it to you. I just know it works great for us. And it has worked great for us. And the relationship, you honestly, with your team and your handlers, man, it is a, it is a tight group because all of our – operators and our deputies that are on our team have become you have the father of the dog which is the handler and all of us are now the uncle of the dog because we've trained with this dog so much i mean he would go home with one of us and be like hey let me borrow your dog for a weekend he's like sure because you know how to talk to you know how to talk to dog because in the essence we've become dog handlers and respect ourselves because there's going to be times when that dog goes into the first room on the left, comes back out, and we got to give it a search command. The guy's in front because the handler's not up there. The handler's further back, generally, further back in the entry team. And th- these guys are sending dogs on additional – they're giving them a search command. The dog identifies their posture. The dog identifies, that's my pack. Those are my people. I shall continue to search for the good guy and the, the, the hostage taker and the hostage. And they know their role. They're very – but, again – they're near ser- service life. And most of it has already expired for them. And they're like towards the end. And you're like, that's a bummer. That's the part that's kind of a bummer. But we know it, it comes with the turf. Maybe it's like that for humans. You get really good at something. You're like, I'm out of here. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> like it. We're old. You're like, you're, it's the golden years. It's like, it's time for you to go. Yeah. Yeah. It seems <laughs> to work job. out that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for your service. <laughs> hey, I just, uh, before yeah, we go, I just want to say one thing. Uh, yeah, here's your one. <laughs> Before we go, I just want to say one thing because I think this is the key, and we saw it with tone recall. Um, Greg, you mentioned something else at the beginning of this. This with the breaker the, uh, bar, two dog, the breaker bar. Uh, this with the two dog deployment on hostages. This is all because of open minds. And um, Mike, I don't even know if you know this, but Matt Allard and I went to uh, uh, Adler School together 
a long time ago, uh, and it was when we first met each other. And um, Greg, you're training uh, Riverside a little bit now. Um, Matt and I talk all the time. Actually, Matt just hit me up, and uh, I, I guess he got the green light to potentially get a dog mm -hmm. down the line. And um, Matt's always had an open mind to training. Him and I were training in a situation where toys, food, all of that stuff was off the table, and we spent our weekends working with the dogs that we were going to school with, with toys and food and kind of implementing different ways into things because we had an open mind. Uh, Riverside County had an open mind to go to Greg to work with Zach down in San Diego. Mike, you had an open mind to look at the scenario that you saw from the FBI. Uh, Eric Stambro had an open mind to say, let me see what this tone thing looks like. Um, we all had an open mind to say, eh, let's try this break stick thing, even if it seems dumb. Now we're opening up what you're talking about with this two dog thing and a hostage situation and saying, yeah, we've never done it. It's not something that's you know, used across the board, but have an open mind. And again, you already said it doesn't mean it's what we're going to use. Not everybody's going to use a brake stick. Not everybody's going to use tone. Not everybody's going to use toys and training. But having an open mind to a different process to see how something else can work um, allows you to see if it's going to be something that works for your team or if it's just something that's not going to work for your team. But if your our way is the only way and we're going to stick with the same way we've been doing it since 1982, then you're fucking yourself out of a lot of progression into something that might work better now. So uh, congratulations, Mike, on having an open mind. I assume that it's not just with dogs. I'm guessing you probably brought a lot of things into that SWAT agency that weren't being used, and it's just because you had an open mind to try new things, and I think that's that's how light bulbs get developed, right? I bet as Edison's first uh, first go at it, I'm sure the light bulb didn't light up and you know illuminate a room. I'm sure it was a whole lot of failures, and then the shit worked. So. Thank you for having an open mind. I think that's the biggest part of this industry is knowing when to say no and knowing to say, yeah, let's give it a try. And you mentioned, Rich, you mentioned uh, Matt Allert, and he worked for me for years, and he was one of our premier canine handlers. And his dog, again, it was one of the few in the fleet that was just perfect for this, absolutely perfect for it. And But as you guys say in the dog world, from my learned, my small integration exposure, it runs down the leash, right? So the like a the handler, the dog is a reflection of the handler. And you're like Matt was an outstanding. He's now the, one of the canine sergeants mm -hmm. that oversees our canine team. And uh, you're right, the open mind. Like even Matt brought in, like uh, he's he's going to he sees Greg. We got guys going up there. We go to Echelon Canine, Echelon Canine with Zach down in San Diego, who's now teaching hostage rescue with dogs. So there there there's people out there that. Are, and anytime anybody reaches out to us, and we're like, hey, well, we want to explore the idea. And we're like, hey, I'll, I'll just, I'll send you some material of the PowerPoint or some slides or some photographs and some videos. And I go, just tell them what you think, man. Again, I don't, we don't make any, as an agency, we don't make any money by selling the idea. We're like, hey, we just want to share it because we think there's enormous value in it. And which for us as a department, there has been. But we also are not naive to the challenges of other organizations of, hey, they got a smaller fleet. They just don't have the number of personnel. They just can't do it. And I'm like, yep, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah, we're going to have we're gonna have Matt actually on the show coming up um, talking about. And we can actually expound upon what we're talking about, this subject matter, also getting into supervision, rebuilding the whole unit and everything else. So um, you guys can look forward to that. Right now, Mike, how do people get a hold of you um, if they are wanting more information or if they um, if just from the information you've provided, just to even in a, a, a tactical end? Uh, they can send me an email, which uh, uh, I can provide it if you guys need it. It's up to you. It's going out to yep. all the listeners, or you could have we can have them reach out to us, and then we can forward it to you. If, if that would be great. A, okay, we'll, we'll, be great. we'll vet that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm new at this. I'm new no, at this whole thing. That's, yeah. And then uh, also, anybody like, out there. Give me your phone number. What? You guys... <laughs> give me your phone number. <laughs> give me cell phone. What else you got? Um, and then an address information, please, for people want to mail you something. No. Um, but if uh, if and any of you guys out there that are running conferences, I mean, I, I think, Mike, you, this would be a freaking excellent class. We're always getting, you know, these, these guys that are running conferences looking for new information. And this is not a class I've seen out there. So. Um, you know, just another resource. Uh, we'll put our email out on this, uh, on the podcast and show notes. You guys can hit us up and then, uh, we'll vet it to, to Mike. 
So, Mike, thank you. Um, it's it's awesome to speak to somebody that has a passion for what you do. You're in it for the right reasons. Um, you know, Rich, I talk about it all the time about the guys. It's less about them and more about the mission and, and getting getting the mission done, getting people home safe, um, getting whether it's civilian, whether it's cops. And we appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing sharing all this information with us. Thank you for having me. And uh, when you do get Matt on here, make sure you give him hard questions. Oh, hard yeah, yeah. Questions. Matt, you need to answer these hard questions. <laughs> Anything with two syllables is a hard question for Matt. We got to get it a little simple for him. <laughs> All right, Mike, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, do me a favor. Keep your phone on after we say goodbye. Uh, we got to download this, so I don't want you hanging up yet. Uh, in the meantime, train hard. And be safe. <laughs> I'm ready. Ready? Ready? Go. Ayuda, 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 ayuda,